thank heavens for English theatre bars. We've had two acts of this play. Complete suffering, both on stage and off. I don't know what your tastes are in theatre. Maybe you like the... Uh, the sweat and the grunt school of acting. <laughs> Me, I, I come to the theatre for fun, for laughs, for excitement. Tonight, oh, brother... Simon! Comes the producer's wife. What shall I say? Excuse me. Oh, darling. <laughs> Tell me honestly, what do you think of it? Well, I can honestly say, Madge, I have never seen anything like it in my life. Or isn't it thrilling? Now, you stay right here. I want you to meet John. He's very clever. He used to be an actor once, you know. Yes. Yes, I know. Come, darling. I want you to meet the most fantastic man. I've told you about him. John, this is Simon Templer. <laughs> the stupidity of the press and the public. Perfectly beautiful play, and I have to take it off in three days. All that money just gone. There'll be other plays. <laughs> Shall we have drinks out here? All right. A bit chilly out of the sun. Let's pull it forward. All right. There you are, Hazard. Mm, that's fine. You know, I'll simply have to get up to London tomorrow and try and solve our domestic problems. Running this house without any help is absolute madness. No, I like it like this. Just the two of us. Oh, darling, how sweet. But it's not very practical. Hey, you're cold. No, I'm fine, really. No, I'll get you a sweater. Thank you. Splendidly, Mrs. Clarence. Now, next week you can start getting up for a few minutes each day. Oh, isn't that rushing things a little, Doctor? Not at all. No, it's high time she was getting some exercise. Incidentally, have you met your new neighbour yet? No. Who? Adrian Halbert. Oh, yes, she moved into Rose Cottage next door a few days after your accident. I've got to tell you. Oh, really? What's she like? Oh, she's a very attractive girl. Wouldn't you say, Mr. Clarence? I wouldn't know. I've only seen her from a distance. I'll see you soon, Mrs. Clannam. Thank you, Doctor. Goodbye. Bye. By the way, Mr. Clannam, that nurse I spoke to you about, she's free now. Shall I have a phone you? Oh, thank you all the same. I've got a housekeeper arriving tomorrow. Oh, well, I hope she works out for you. You could do with some help. You look exhausted. Exhausted, Doctor? Or guilty? Now, look here. You mustn't blame yourself for this. Then who do I blame? It was my fault. Madge might have been killed. But she wasn't killed. In a few weeks, she'll be fine. They'll have some visitors. You know, ask a few friends over. It'll do you both good. Anyway, I'll pop in again tomorrow morning. Uh, Dr. Sprague, if you call too often, she'll think she's much sicker than she really is. Couldn't we leave it that, um, if she needs you, I'll phone? Well, if you'd prefer it that way. Well, you said yourself she's going along splendidly. Yes, so she is. Well, if the least other... thing goes wrong, I'll call you immediately. And thank you very much for what you've done already. We both appreciate it. Well, not at all. Uh, but you will call me if I can be of help. Of course, Doctor. Goodbye. Goodbye. Uh, 
Uh, Dr. Sprague says that in another six weeks, you'll be as fit as ever. Oh, it's the best day yet. No pain at all. I feel so terribly responsible. Oh, it was an accident. You know it and I know it. Yeah, sorry. I shouldn't have brought it up. I've got an idea. Couldn't we have Margaret and Frank in for drinks? Darling, I won't let you rush things. Dr. Sprague said no visitors for another two weeks. Oh, I suppose you're right. But I can have a telephone here, can't I? I phoned the post office again yesterday. And? Yes, sir. We have your order in hand, sir. We will install an upstairs extension as soon as possible, sir. But I said that two weeks ago. There's bureaucracy for you. Anyway, maybe they'll come tomorrow. Is there anything particularly you'd like for lunch? Oh, that's the easiest. Ah, how about some fish? A nice salad. It's half past eleven. There'll be new bread at the bakery. Poor darling. All this cooking and shopping and looking after me. Surely there's someone we can find to help. <laughs> I phoned every agency in London. Domestic help is simply non-existent. Anyway, I enjoy looking after you. Uh. Good morning, Adrian. Pretty. How's Mrs. Claren? Hmm? Oh, not too well, I'm afraid. Uh oh. John, please let me help. I've loads of free time. Oh, that's sweet of you, Adrian. But you've never met Madge, and she's very shy of strangers. Anyway, I've got a housekeeper arriving tomorrow. Oh, that's marvellous. <laughs> I hope so. Fifteen years with the same family in Dublin. Or so she says. Claims she's used to invalids and loves to cook. As Irish as they make them. Mm. There you are, Mrs. Jafferty. Two pounds of stew and beef. Shall I put it on the bill? If you please, Mr. Smith. Clarence, eight shillings stew and beef. Well, Mrs. Jafferty, now you've been in Cookham a week, do you think you're going to like it here? Oh, it's as pretty a town as you could ask for, Mr. Smith. And the Clarence are such fine people. You give them my regards, won't you? Indeed, I will, Mr. Smith. Oh, uh, Mrs. Jafferty, I wonder if you'd do me a favour. I've got an order here for Miss Halbert of Rose Cottage. Uh, she lives right next door to you. My boy's out and I've promised her for lunch. Uh, I wonder if you'd just drop it off for me. Sure, and I'll be delighted, Mr. Smith. That's very good of you. You're welcome, Mr. Smith. Good morning. Thank Good to see you too. Like a stone you drop from the blue, I just can't believe it. <laughs> my entire establishment is yours. Anything you wish. Ah, oh, that's just as well because my bags are in the car outside. Don't worry, we'll have them brought in. And now, what to drink? A Manhattan? I mix it myself. No, at this hour, uh, just a pint from the barrel. Warm, flat, nourishing, and very British. And what brings you to Cookham? An adventure? A criminal? After a month in Paris, I suddenly had a crazy belt of nostalgia for the sight of your ugly puss. Simon, this is me, Mario, remember? You can be honest with me, no? Why not? Can you keep a secret? It is like telling a dead man. I'm looking for a woman. Uh-huh. 38, 24, 36. Bellissima! Well, that's only a head. <laughs> Here we are. No, it's Mr. Ingbeef. 
Ah, here it is at last. Thanks so much, Mrs. Jefferty. I hope it wasn't a bother. No trouble at all. A few yards out of your way on a fine day like this. Money eggs? Oh, yes. How's Mrs. Claren? Well, as well as could be expected under the circumstances. I'd love to come over and see her. Oh, no. Not allowed, miss. Doctor was very hard and fast about it. No visitors. Oh, well, please tell her I was asking about her, will you? Indeed I will, miss. And good day to you. Thanks again, Mrs. Jafferty. Oh, you're welcome, miss. Mrs. Jafferty? Mrs. Jafferty? <gasps> Hello, Adrian. You scared the life out of me. Oh, I'm sorry. Mrs. Jafferty dropped my meat off on her way home, and she forgot this. You needn't have bothered. I'm sorry to barge in like this. I did call Mrs. Jafferty, but she didn't answer. You could never barge in. John, now that I'm here, couldn't I at least say hello to Madge? Ah, oh, sweet of you. I wish you could. I'm afraid Mrs. Jafferty's bathing her right now. Oh. Well, you know what housekeepers are, what they say goes. Otherwise, they go. Then where are you? Okay, then, some other time. Soon as Maggie's strong enough, you'll be the first visitor she'll have. I promise. She's dying to meet you. Thanks, John. Goodbye. Goodbye. Who's that? Oh, uh, just some deliveries. I ordered some champagne for you. Thank you, darling. Oh, incidentally, Madge, um, I have a few bills to pay. I'll give you a check. Thanks. How much do you want? Oh, well, uh, Taylor's bill this month, you, they'll make it 300. Well, isn't that rather... What? Well, well, go ahead. Go ahead, Madge, say it. You think it's too much, don't you? Uh, no, darling, not at all. You've every right, of course, since it is your money. John, that's cruel. Oh, the truth has a way of being cruel, hasn't it? And the truth is that you pay for everything in this house. The food, the drink, the car, even my clothes. Well, it gets a little wearing after a time. A man doesn't particularly enjoy living off a woman. Is that how you classify me? I thought I was your wife. Madge, darling, I'm sorry. I didn't mean it. I think you did. No. It's just that sometimes I, I feel... I don't know. I've never bought you anything, really. Just a few flowers and chocolates. You buy your own furs, jewellery. You even paid for your own engagement ring. John. Why does it have to matter so much to you? Why can't you just accept it? Why do you have to think of it as my money? It's our money. This isn't my house. It's our home. Yeah, of course it is. I'm sorry, darling. Let's forget it. All right. John, tell me something. What? Are you happy? With me, I mean. What sort of question is that? Are you? Of course. I love you. You don't say it very often. Well, I... Uh, oh, does it embarrass you? A little, perhaps. Darling. Once in a while. Tell me. I love you, Madge. 
very much. What? Oh. <laughs> Sometimes I think if I weren't married to you, I'd, I'd die. <gasps> There it is, a custom-built Manhattan. Thank you, Mario. Uh, Simon, we are friends, no? We are friends, yes, yes. It's just that sometimes I do not feel I know you at all. <laughs> I'm not very complicated, Mario. Like all men, I am searching for personal fulfillment. I won't accept my by proxy, that's all. I do not understand. Well, it's, it's very simple. I don't like being a cog in the machine. Being one of the millions of ants that devour the dragon is all very noble. But it's not half as much fun as being St. George, is it? With the sword in the hand and the foot on the neck of the dragon, eh? And an arm around the fair maiden. Sound cockeyed? No, not with that addition. Apart from looking at the scenery, what are you doing in Cuckoo? And no jokes, please. Hmm? What are you doing in Cuckoo? Uh, what do you know about a man named John Clarence? Mm. Quite recently, his wife had a serious accident. She nearly died. Well, his other wives had accidents, too. They did die. He has been married before. Twice. How about another custom bill? Sure. This woman coming now is the housekeeper. Oh, what's her name? Mrs. Jafferty. Mrs. Jafferty? Yes. Uh, how is Mrs. Clarence? Oh, would you be knowing her? Why, well, yes, you might say I'm a sort of friend of the family. I even knew the former Mrs. Claren. Oh, would I be the American lady? Yes, Grace Seldon. I was once engaged to her sister. Well, you know, fancy that. You might tell them I was asking. I will indeed, sir, if you'll be telling me your name. This is Mr. Simon Templer, Mrs. Jafferty. Oh, pleased to meet you, indeed. Sure, I'll be telling Mr. Claren you were asking. Goodbye, Mrs. Jafferty. Goodbye, now. Simon. Hmm? You are perhaps incognito. Did I do wrong to mention your name? No, of course not, Mario. <sighs> Another Manhattan. Or do you feel like some dinner? Mr. Templer is having dinner with me. I am. Well, aren't you? Yes. Yes, if uh, Mario will excuse me. Excuse you? I congratulate you. I will bring the menu. That won't be necessary, Mario. We're dining at my home. Bring us two Manhattans on me. The lady's spoken, Mario. You wish him orders like a general. You want to argue? Not with a general as pretty as you. However, sometimes I ask questions. Sometimes I answer. What's your name? Adrian Halbert. We've met before? You don't remember. Oh, yes, of course. It was Paris in the spring. The Central Park in the Ray. Calgary in the Chinook. Now you're guessing. Well, how about you're a special investigator for the Majestic Insurance Company? And you're in Cookham for exactly the same reasons I am. To prevent John Claren from murdering his third wife. <laughs> It was a suburb dinner, except for one thing. What? You. You've shattered my faith. In what? Well, in evolution. You're beautiful, you're gay, you're amusing. Oh, you're a superb cook. But you're an insurance investigator. <laughs> insurance companies found out years ago that investigators could do a lot more if they didn't look like investigators. Well, that's true. Now, supposing we compare notes on John Claren. All right. What do you know? Well, he went to a good school, where he never got into any trouble. And then he became an actor. Then he married and went to live in Australia. Well, the first Mrs. Claren fell from the 10th floor of a Brisbane hotel. John collected 50,000 pounds of insurance and then came back to England. Mm-hmm. Then he got mixed up in the theatre again. He produced a few plays in London. All of them flopped. He was virtually bankrupt when he married American heiress, Grace Seldon. 
Yes, I knew her. What was she like? Like most pretty girls. Selfish, petulant, spoiled, but charming. Anyway, they moved to New York, and six months later, Grace was electrocuted. This time, there was no insurance. But John did inherit a quarter of a million dollars. Very enterprising. Very. Then he came back to England? Yes, and the same thing started all over again. More plays that flopped. I saw his last one. The day after he married Madge, John insured her life for 70,000 pounds. And a few weeks ago, she was almost killed. That's why I'm in Cookham. Adrian. You know, there's just one thing wrong with this. I thought you would have spotted it. What? Well, up to now, Claren has always worked alone. Don't you think it's pretty stupid of him to clutter up this operation with Mrs. Jafferty? Aren't you going to bed? Uh, no, not yet. No, I've, I've got some work to do on the new play. Gilbert has great talent. He's written a very bad third act. And you'll fix it, darling. I hope so. It'll be a tremendous success. And you'll be the most famous producer in London. Yes, we said that about the last one. Oh, this one's different. You think so? I know it. Anything else you want? <laughs> no, thanks. Good night, sweet. I have a hunch that Claren is doing some hard thinking tonight. Why? Well, you'll either call the whole thing off or you'll panic and hurry things up. I don't understand. Well, it's the predictable reaction of the ungodly. I've seen it happen a thousand times. Claren's been at the end of a diving board for some time. Any day now, he's going to take the plunge. What on earth are you talking about? Well, I told Mrs. Jafferty that I was once engaged to Grace Claren's sister. I still don't understand. Grace Claren never had a sister. <laughs> Cookham. 10.30. Arrive, Maidenhead. 10.43. Yes. Yes, yes, I know. But look, Gilbert, dear boy, yours is not a play of action. It's a detailed study of an environment. Y yes. Anyway, I think I've licked our problem in the third act, and I'd like to talk to you. OK, can you have dinner tonight at my club? Right, should we say 7 o'clock? Fine. Fine, I, I look forward to seeing you. Right, goodbye. I just phoned Gilbert. I'm going to meet him. He'll see things my way now. I was sure he will. What train are you catching? Three o'clock, if that's all right with you. Of course. I'm meeting Gilbert at the club at seven, but I'll catch the 8.55 back. I'll leave your supper all ready for you before I go. What would you like? Oh, whatever's easiest. Well, how about an ice lamb stew? <laughs> you won't have time to cook it. Of course I will. It's only 10 o'clock. I'll go down to the village and get the meat right away. Oh, John, don't take so much trouble. It's no trouble. I'll be back in about 45 minutes, dear. All right, dear. You were quick. Oh, won't you come in? Thank you, Adrian. Would you like a cup of coffee? No, thanks, Fred. I haven't got the time. I've got to catch the uh, 10.30 train to London. How's Madge? Oh, she's better today. That's why I came round. 
This is the first time I've left Mrs. Jafferty alone with her, so I took the liberty of telling her that if she needed anything, to call on you. OK, I'll pop over after breakfast. No, I wouldn't do that. She's very independent. No, just leave them alone together, unless Mrs. Jafferty telephones. OK. Thank you, Adrian. I'm very grateful. Well, I haven't really done anything yet. Oh. Oh, you two have met, haven't you? Yes. Hello, Claren. How are you? Fine. Well, I must fly. Uh, am I interrupting something? No. Just I've got to catch the 10.30 train to London. Well, let me drop you at the station. Sure it's not too much trouble? No trouble at all. Keep the coffee hot. Goodbye, Adrian. Thank you. Goodbye. How's Madge? As well as can be expected. Well, when can I come over and see her? What are you doing in Cookham? I'm playing golf. I'm seeing Adrian. When can I come over and see Madge? Unfortunately, she's not allowed visitors. Yes, I sort of gather that from your housekeeper. Could you know her? Yes, I met her last night in the pub, didn't she tell you? Oh, she's a great talker. I don't listen to half of it. Well, thank you for the lift, Mr. Templar. You're welcome. Going to stay in town all day? No, I'm catching the 8.55 back. Have fun. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Thank you. Oh, by the way, uh, I suppose you wouldn't know what platform at Paddington the 8.55 leaves from this evening? <laughs> Blimey, sir, I wouldn't have the foggiest idea. No, I suppose not. I'm afraid it was rather a silly question. That's all right, sir. We all ask him from time to time. There you are, Mrs. Jaffrey. One pound of stew in that. Are you sure that'll be enough for three people? Oh, it's only for me and Mrs. Claren. Himself's gone up to London. Good day to you, Mr. Smith. Good day, Mrs. Jaffrey. Good morning, miss. Good morning. Uh, would you be having a tin of that poison they use for rats? The brown stuff that looks like shoe polish. Do you know what I mean? Yes, yes, we have some of it. Would you like a four ounce or a ten ounce tin? Four ounces will be doing me nicely. How much is it? Three and sixpence. I'll get you to sign the poison book. Jafferty just went in. Oh, I swear I didn't see her go out. She probably went out when you were driving John to the station. Mm, probably. You know what's even more peculiar? What? Well, knowing Mrs. Jafferty, I just can't believe she didn't tell John what I said about being engaged to Grace's sister. The Irish are so unpredictable. Mm. But women aren't.
I'm back, Madge. Oh, good, dear. Make me a stew, did you? Of course I did. Now, all you've got to do is light this at 6.45. It'll be piping hot by 7. Now, uh, let's see. Magazines, television. Mm -hmm. What about cigarettes? Oh, I've got plenty. Anything else you want? Only if you to hurry back. Bye, Madge. Have a good day, dear. I will. Goodbye, darling. Goodbye. I'll be back by 10, dear. All right, darling. Bye. Bye, darling. You're in two minutes, ma'am. Oh, dear, oh, dear. It's so upset I am. I hardly know what I'm doing. It's my sister, you see. She's been taken ill, and not a soul to look after her. Oh, dear. Oh, is this the side? This side, side madam, yes. Well, Mr. Claren, I'm not interested in these actionless, pressureless plays the modern theatre calls honest. And what's your objection to a little plot? Nothing, Gilbert, nothing. But you haven't written a play of action. What do you make the time? 6.45. <coughs> uh, go on, Gilbert, you were saying.
Adrian, what time do you make it? Ten to seven. There's something wrong. There's something very wrong. Nothing possibly can happen to Madge with John in London. No, the fact remains that Mrs. Jafferty went out at 2.30 and still isn't back. Madge has been alone in that house for four hours. What do you think we ought to do? I think I'll pay the Claren Maynage a little visit. Shall I come with you? No, I'll be back in ten minutes. Don't worry. <laughs> Gilbert, dear boy, that is the point. A message, social significance. I have no message, Mr. Claren. I doubt if I'm capable of improving the world. All I want to do is to give the paying customers a thoroughly entertaining evening in the theatre. And if you take that attitude, you might produce a success occasionally instead of a series of dismal flops. Well, that's how you feel. I feel, Mr. Claren, that you are an untalented, overblown professional bore. <sighs> I have a train to catch at 8.55. Obviously, we've nothing further to discuss. My bill, please. Dr. Spray, got a pleasant surprise. Hello, Mr. Clarence. Hello. Your prognosis turned out to be 100% correct. Madge is doing splendidly. Well enough to be left alone. She's not alone. Remember, I told you I had a housekeeper, Mrs. Jafferty. Turned out to be an absolute treasure. Glad. She had no references. Once heard such terrifying things about servants these days. Still, I had to have someone, didn't I? Could I ask you a favour? I'm sure you could, Mr. Claren. See, a friend drove me to the station this morning, so I don't have my car with me. I wonder if you could give me a lift home. Well, it's a little out of my way. Oh, only a quarter of a mile. I'd appreciate it so much. Um, all right. And then he became absolutely insulting. I don't understand writers, I swear I never will. Complete egocentrics, every one of them. <laughs> never think of anybody but themselves. Oh, is this me already? Oh, thank you, Doctor.
Where are you going, Claren? Back to Brisbane. On New York to Grace's apartment on Park Avenue. It's my wife. She's dead. Your wives have a habit of dying. What are you talking about? This. You poisoned your wife. Poisoned her? You're out of your mind. Am I? I was in London all day. Were you? You know I was. You drove me to catch the 10.30 train this morning. You saw me get on it. Yes, but you got off it again, didn't you, Claren, at the next station up the line? I did no such thing. I had dinner with a writer. He'll vouch for it. Will he? So will the waiters. And on the train coming home, I, I met Dr. Sprague. He drove me straight to the door. Then who did poison your wife? He was Mrs. Jafferty. You see, I, I had to take up that reference. I was desperate. With Madge so ill, I, I couldn't look after her and the house. I don't see why not. You're a very talented husband. Uh, it was Mrs. Jafferty. What possible motive could Mrs. Jafferty have for killing your wife? Robbery. Well, she's taken Madge's jewellery. Oh, go and look for yourself. I mean, a jewel box is broken open. It's empty. Who are you calling? The police. I wouldn't bother. I called them myself, Mrs. Jafferty. What did you call me? Mrs. Jafferty. You know, I have to hand it to you, Clara, and it was a beautiful performance. You created an identity that all the tradesmen in the village believed. Then to avoid visitors, you told them Dr. Sprague wouldn't allow it. That way, no one could ask questions about the mythical Mrs. Jafferty. Templar. Templar, we can work this out. Can we? Yeah. There's a 70,000 pounds insurance policy on Maggie's life. I'll collect it in a month. Six weeks at the most. I'll give you half. 35,000 pounds. All right, I'll, I'll make it 40. And all the jewellery here. Take it. I'm not interested in the jewellery or the money. All I want to see is you get what's coming to you, Claren. How about the first, Mrs. Claren, the one that fell from the hotel window? You pushed her. Yes. And Grace Seldon in New York. Yes. And now Madge. Yes, yes. Adrian? Do you get that? Every word. It was different with Madge. How? I loved Madge. I didn't love the others, but I did love Madge. <sighs> you know, John. I believe you did. Just a minute, sir. Thank you for getting here so quickly, Inspector. You probably didn't hear too much of that, but Miss Halbert has a verbatim transcript. John, why? What did I do wrong?
entirely with you differently. And you'll want very much to 